Well, in our continuing uh, study of the, of the overview of the covenants, the next covenant, the covenant of grace, as you see here, is the Davidic covenant. And this has, if, the, if of all the covenants, of the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant, uh, there are aspects of it that are so vital to understand properly uh, how things work their way out in God's eternal plan. The Davidic covenant is where God's purposes to redeem a people reaches its climactic stage uh, in the Old Testament, as far as the Old Testament is concerned. In 2 Samuel 5, we see David centralizing and unifying the kingdom, uh, theocratic kingdom, by defeating all his enemies and making Jerusalem as a permanent location place uh, for his throne. So that in 2 Samuel chapter 6, David brings the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. And he makes it, Jerusalem, the center of the worship of God's people. One could rightly say that in the Old Testament, that Jerusalem was the holiest place on the face of the earth. With reference to the Old Covenant. This specifies uh, some of the things about the covenant. And I want you to turn... 2 Samuel 7, which is where that covenant is spelled out for us. Now what we see here, for example, let me read verses 8 through 17. Now therefore thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be ruler over my people, Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone and have cut off your enemies from before you. And I will make you a great name, like the names of the great men who were on earth. I will also appoint a place for my people, Israel, and will plant them that they may live in their own place and not be disturbed again, nor will the wicked afflict them any more as formerly. Even from the day that I commanded judges to be over my people, Israel, I will give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord also declares to you that the Lord will make a house for you. When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your seed after you, who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of the sons of men. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever in accordance with all these words and all the vision. So Nathan spoke to David. So what we see here in the Davidic covenant is this breakdown that you can see on this slide. Here are the promises of the Davidic covenant. An everlasting possession for his generations to prosper. A building of a house for God to be glorified among his people. A seed who will establish his kingdom. And David's throne and his kingdom shall be established forever. Now at this point I'm not going to delve into any real detail about the Davidic covenant. I'm going to bring that out more in the section when I talk about what is the nature of the kingdom. We're going to get into some real specifics uh, of the Davidic covenant. And, and your understanding, let me tell you this. Your understanding of the Davidic covenant will determine whether you're a dispensationalist or you uh, believe what the scripture says in terms of covenant theology. Your understanding of the Davidic covenant will help you understand when did Jesus, uh, who we're going to see, is that promised seed, when did he assume uh, the throne of David? Where is that throne in all this? We'll deal with that when we get to the nature of the kingdom. 
But I do want you to see that there is a unity of this covenant with the preceding covenants. What the Davidic covenant does is that it brings forward everything else now. What is the, uh, we've seen with the promise of the land in the Abrahamic covenant. We saw before that in the Adamic covenant that there was uh, going to be a war between the two seed lines. We see here that God's giving David victory over his enemies, giving him rest. Uh, that seed line of Abraham, which is now David's seed line as well, uh, they, it will take on uh, that theocratic kingdom which was brought to being in the Mosaic Covenant is going to find which uh, was represented by a movable presence of God with the tabernacle. Remember, it was a tent that moved from place to place. But now uh, we're going to see in the Davidic Covenant, uh, especially in the one who will build that house, Historically, the one who will build that house, David, and David won't be able to do it because of his sin, but Solomon, his son, will build that great house in the temple of Solomon. And there's that great scene in the scriptures where you have the transfer. They take the Ark of the Covenant and they put it into uh, the Holy of Holies section in the sanctuary of the temple. And it says there in 2 Kings that the old temple filled with smoke. As it, it's, it, this is the imagery. God has come to dwell here. Of course, he's not there physically as such. But again, remember, Jerusalem in that period of time and the Holy of Holies, Mount Zion, where the temple was built, was the most sacred place on the face of the earth in the Old Covenant. And so we see in the defeat of Israel's enemies by David, the victory of the seed of the woman over the seed of the serpent continues. And if we recall, remember in Genesis 17, 6, that God promised, remember what that promise was? Kings shall come out of you. We're talking to, Dave, uh, to Abraham. The Davidic covenant is the fundamental realization of that promise though not exhaustively. God promised to establish Israel in a land and the consolidation of theocratic power in Jerusalem is the manifestation of this. So that God promised to establish David's seed as we're see, going to see, but David's seed is not different from Abraham's seed. It's not different. It merely is the continuation of it. And the law of the Mosaic Covenant did not cease with the Davidic, uh, Davidic Covenant, but it became the very law to govern Israel. Now I just want to point you to one passage. Turn to 2 Kings and look at, well not 2 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 2. 1 Kings chapter 2. Verses 1 through 4. As David's time to die drew near, he charged Solomon his son, saying, I'm going the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and show yourself a man. And keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk his, in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his ordinances, and his testimonies according to what is written in the law of Moses, that you may succeed in all that you do and wherever you turn, so that the Lord may carry out his promise which he spoke concerning me, saying, If your sons are careful on their way, to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. So what law governed the redeemed community in the, Davi uh, the Davidic covenant? The Mosaic law. It did, the Davidic covenant does not replace the Mosaic law. It becomes the law of the theocratic kingdom. And so we see in that, uh, this is very briefly an overview of the Davidic Covenant. Like I said, we're going to get to it in detail, the specifics of this. But let's, uh, let's move on to the New Covenant. One of the things that you, uh, if you 
uh, saw last night when we read chapter 7 out of the Confession of Faith, it mentioned that the new covenant is marked by simplicity and power. It doesn't have the ornateness. It doesn't have the elaborateness of the old covenant. But what it, uh, in its simplicity, it comes with greater power. So it's been a, apparent that I've already associated the covenants of promise with the new covenant. Because when I would talk about, for example, the promise of the seed line of Abraham possessing the gates of the, of the enemy, I had you move over to the Matthew to see how in the new covenant, uh, what Jesus is saying in the new covenant is merely carrying forward what the promise was in the old. Let me read uh, out of the Confession of Faith, <clears throat> chapter 7, section 6. Concerning the New Covenant. Under the Gospel, when Christ the substance was exhibited, the ordinances in which this covenant is dispensed are the preaching of the Word, the administration of the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper, which, though fewer in number and administered with more simplicity and less outward glory, yet in them it is held forth in more fullness, evidence, and spiritual efficacy to all nations, both Jews and Gentiles, and is called the New Testament. There are therefore uh, not two covenants of grace differing in substance, but one and the same under various dispensations. So the Old Testament promises the new. Uh, Jeremiah has some interesting, Jeremiah prophesied of the coming of the new covenant. And what we see in that prophecy is this. Turn with me over to Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31. Uh, verses 31 through 34. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach again each man his neighbor, and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord." For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. This in Jeremiah is that promise of this new covenant. Now while it is true that it was historically fulfilled under Cyrus's edict, it is exhaustively, it is not exhaustively fulfilled because of all that is true of the new covenant, even though it was set forth in, in Jeremiah's time. Keep in mind, to whom did the Abrahamic covenant promise belong, or the land promise. To who really gets the land promise? The seed of Abraham gets the land promise. Romans 4 indicates that Canaan is not, as we saw, the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant in its fullest sense. Again, that land promise was but a down payment on the world. In the new covenant, all the nations of the earth are going to receive the blessings. And anybody in the nation, in any nation, any language group, any racial group, any person that believes in Jesus is the son of Abraham, heir to the promise. So what we see here 
that we've always got to remember that these promises are made to those who are of the faith of Abraham. While the physical lineage is a blessing, it is not a guarantee of covenantal blessings. Pastor Moorcraft tells the story of talking to someone about Jesus. And he says, do you know the Lord Jesus? He says, no, but my granddaddy did. <laughs> well, wonderful for your granddaddy. Do you, do you think because your granddaddy was Christian and his faith that uh, that somehow is going to seep over into you without believing? Some think that. The Jews of Jesus' time thought that. But it's a great mistake. Uh, <clears throat> turn over to Matthew 21. And take a look at verses 33 through 46. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard and put a, small, a wall around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey. And when the harvest time approached, he sent his slaves to the vine growers to receive his produce. And the vine growers took his slaves and beat one and killed another and stoned a third. And again he sent another group of slaves larger than the first. They did the same thing to them, but afterward he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the vine growers saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. They took him and threw him out in the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? They said to him, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end and will rent out the vineyard to another vine growers who will pay him the proceeds at the proper seasons. Jesus said to them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected thus became the chief cornerstone? This came about from the Lord and it's marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation producing the fruit of it. And he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. And when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they understood he was speaking about them. And when they sought to seize him, they feared the multitude because they held him to be a prophet. All this goes to show that <clears throat> we'll talk about this a little bit more uh, we talk when we discuss the kingdom, but the kingdom will be ripped away from national Israel because of their unbelief. Jesus is the son. He's the one who's come. Now, who are the other slaves who were beaten and killed? The prophets. And the Pharisees, you know, sometimes par uh, Jesus says parables were given so that in seeing they would not see. But here's a parable where Jesus wanted them to see, and they saw it, and it says, oh, Jesus, you're talking about us. We get the point. And they wanted to seize him, to kill him, but then they couldn't because the people regarded him with such esteem. But they will, plot, they will make their plot to get him eventually. But with regard to this promise of the new covenant, one of the wonderful, most wonderful things about this new covenant Outside, of course, the fact that you have the substance of the shadows of the sacrificial system. All those sacrifices were pointing ultimately to the Lord Jesus Christ. But Ezekiel talks about the new covenant, and it mentions a, a promise that is wonderful. I want you to turn to Ezekiel chapter 36. And look at verses 22 through 27. Ezekiel 36, 22 through 27. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, 
that I am about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you rent. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. Then the nations will know I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. For I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you to your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances." You know, one of the most wonderful promises of the new covenant is this. That law that was written on stone and given to Moses, that law that was external in the old covenant is now come and placed in the hearts of those who are the elect of God, who are the true sons of Abraham, and that law that was external is now within us. And therefore, in the new covenant, the believer has an advantage over... Now, the believers are in the new Old Testament, but he has an advantage over the believers of the old covenant in the sense that believers in the new covenant have a law in their hearts and they have access to a power of greater magnitude than those in the Old Testament. Though you had to have the Spirit in the Old Testament. The Spirit did come at times with His people, but it does account for the fact that you had a lot of fluctuation in the Old Covenant. There's more of a stabilization among the people of God in the New Covenant because the Spirit was, is within us with power. Now, one of the things that we need to understand, whose law was he talking about? The Mosaic law, God's law. Do you hear some say to us today, and they misunderstand Romans 6 and says, well, the Bible says we're under grace, not under law. So I don't have anything to do with the law. But I have the law of love, and the law of love, and I'm following Jesus. I'm not following that law. Well, but how is, the, how is love defined according to the scriptures? Paul says, uh, love fulfills the law. When, when we keep his commandments, and Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Now, are Jesus' commandments any different than Moses' commandments? No. Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law and the prophets. I came to fulfill it. I came to confirm it. And he who speaks less of the commandments will be considered least in the kingdom of God. And so the, the reality is there's not as some want to teach us. Now, where does that attitude come from that we have, uh, that we're under uh, grace and not under law, and therefore the law of God doesn't have anything to do with us? It comes from a dispensational viewpoint, this radical disjunction between the scriptures. There's not this break and in, 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 in failure among the people of God. There were failures among the people of God in the Old Covenant. But it's not that God comes up with another plan in each dispensation. The reality is it builds upon one another and the Mosaic law is that law spiritually in our hearts so that the people of God keep those commandments. So that the heart has been transformed by the power of the Spirit. The heart of flesh, guess what? It loves the law. You know, one of the things, uh, Psalm 119 uh, tells us about the attitude that we should have towards the law of God, and it's this. Psalm 119, verses 110 and 111. I have inherited thy testimonies forever, for they are the joy of my heart. I have inclined my heart to perform thy statutes forever. 
even to the end. David loved the law of God. We're to love the law of God as Christians. But turn over. I want you to turn to Romans 8, and you're going to see something uh, that speaks directly to this point. Romans 8. Look at verses 5 through 13. For those who according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. And if in Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. So what we see here, and I want you to draw your attention to verse 7. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile towards God, it does not subject itself to the law of God. Is there any wonder why unbelievers could care less about uh, obeying Christ? They don't care. And why don't they care? Because they're in bondage to sin. And they're hostile to it. So, but what does it say about the Spirit? If the Spirit dwells within us, and there's the point, if the Spirit dwells in us, we love the law. We're not hostile to the law. The Spirit wants us to obey the law. Who gave the law anyway? God's the one who gave the law. The Holy Spirit, third person in the Trinity, loves the law of God. God the law is the reflection of God's perfection, His holiness, so that the Christian loves the law of God. There's no dichotomy here between the law and grace and such. Uh, <clears throat> what that meant, means over there in Romans 6, by the way, is that when it says we're no longer under law but under grace, meaning we're no longer under the law of its de demands of perfect obedience on us. And when we were under those demands, we were under the law of sin and we were condemned because of it. But in grace, through the Lord Jesus, the bondage is broken and that deliverance comes not by works of the law but by grace. Now that's what it means in Romans. And so what we see here, that Jeremiah's prophecy and his glorious promises of the new covenant, one of them was the fact a full forgiveness of sins. Now I read to you last night out of the confession, it talks about those saints in the old covenant had full remission of sins. How? It, and someone say, well, I don't know about that because it says in Hebrews 10, it says that the blood of bulls and goats cannot atone for sin. That's true. It's exactly right. But again, when that Old Testament believer brought those sacrifices, he was identifying himself by saying, I should be dying. Uh, and that's why it was laid on him. He was identifying himself with that sacrifice. I should be dying, but I'm not. There's going to be a sacrifice for me. In that sense, in trusting, uh, in believing that there was forgiveness with God, they were trusting in the Messiah to come. We're going to see later on, we talk about uh, the relationship of the church in Zion, that these promises of Zion, Jerusalem, are all references to the church. Hebrews brings this out. And so what we see here is that the Lamb of God that indeed takes away the sins of the world has come once and for all and secured salvation for all for whom he has died.
So Jeremiah's prophecy and his glorious promise of the new covenant, you know what it also entails? It entails the bringing of the gospel, the discipleship of all the nations. That's the promise of the new covenant. And that's why Hebrews 8.11 cites verbatim virtually Psalm, uh, Jeremiah 31. And so what we see with regard to the, these covenants now is that uh, we're going to conclude here with reference to the covenants of promise is what I want to, to show you is this, is that <clears throat> there's a continuity in these covenants of promise. There's not a radical disjunction between them. They build upon the other. And here's the points that I want you to, to, to always remember. You have the promise of Messiah to come. You have two sides in history. The seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. The seed of Christ, the seed of the devil. The sons of Abraham, by faith. The sons of Abraham, by faith, get the promises. It is important to be in the covenant, but uh, one can be in the covenant but not of the covenant. We'll talk about that when we talk about who is the true Israel. We look at Romans 9 particularly. So the sons of Abraham are all those men and women, slave or free, that, that trust Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Those are the sons of Abraham. And we're going to see that promise of the establishment. Uh, you have a law that governs the people of God. And that is what is to redeem. Uh, that is what's to govern a redeemed people, that law. And that the king, when he set up the Davidic covenant, you know, let, let me just mention a passage here. I think it's, let's see if I can remember. I think it's over in 1 Kings. Might be 2 Kings 23. Yes, it's 2 Kings 23. Verses 1 through 3. Now remember I talked to you about that the covenant doesn't nullify the covenant before. The Davidic covenant doesn't nullify the Mosaic covenant. Now, as I read this passage to you, <clears throat> just uh, dream with me for a moment. Probably won't be in our lifetime. But could you imagine a president of the United States one day? That's assuming that the United States uh, is still in existence as we know it. We have no guarantee, Scripture, that will be. But look what it says here. Then the king sent, and they gathered to him all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. We're talking about Josiah has come to the throne. And the king went up to the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him, and the priests and the prophets, and all the people, both small and great. And he read. Now, who read? The king read. The king read, both, read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which was found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood by the pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to carry out the words of this covenant that were written in this book and all the people entered into the covenant. Could you imagine a day, let's assume, hundreds of years, I don't know, if the United States is still in existence, on Inauguration Day, Washington, D.C., a man has been elected President of the United States by a people who by now have been, large numbers have been converted to the Lord Jesus Christ, and you know when you convert the Lord Jesus, you love his law, you want to live for him, and you elect people like-minded. So now they have elected men. Can you imagine a president of the United States standing before the world and says, takes the law of God 
and before the world swears, I will keep God's law. And this is the law of the land. And all the people, let's say the throngs that are gathered say, Amen. <laughs> that would be something. But that's what kings are supposed to be. That just goes to, to, to bring out to us why to the extent that we have fallen as a nation. America's not ready for that kind of president, are they? And so we see here that this promise, these, these, uh, these covenants, they build upon another. And we're going to see uh, your understanding of that will determine your understanding of the millennium and uh, your aggressiveness in proclaiming the gospel, your expectations in the proclamation of what will happen. Um, at this point, I think what I want to do is, let me just, Aubrey, would it be a problem if we, we do another section? Are you, would you be able to... Um, Okay. Well, let me let me move on, then. Well, it says, "Do you have any questions?" I let I'll let that one slide. Do you, <laughs> do, you have, do you have any questions before we uh, talk about hermeneutics here and eschatology? Anybody about the covenant? All right. You know, when we're talking about eschatology, one of the biggest things <clears throat> is the issue of hermeneutics. Now, what is hermeneutics? It's just a fancy word for principles of Bible interpretation. In the ongoing debate between covenant theologians and dispensationalists, this is a hot issue. How are you going to interpret the Bible? Now, dispensationalists will make the claim, we are the literalists. We just take the Bible at face value. And that they say this is the only proper way and faithful way to address biblical texts. And they accuse covenant uh, theology adherents to spiritualizing away the Word of God. And so, dispensationalists, They, they like to say that the controversy then between dispensationalism and covenant theology is between a literal and a figurative interpretation and that they are the champions of literal interpretation, meaning that they believe the Bible to be authoritative and inerrant, as if we don't. Now, Dispensationalist Charles Ryrie has made this comment. He says, quote, The dispensationalist claims to use the normal principle of interpretation consistently in all of his study of the Bible. End of quote. The Plymouth Brethren Movement in England, led by John Darby during the early 1800s, which, by the way, is the historical ancestor of dispensational premillennialism as we know it, John Darby insisted that they, the Plymouth Brethren, were the only ones showing fidelity uh, to the Scriptures. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Groups that say, we're the only ones that have the code and the key to understand the Bible. The Mormons have said it. Jehovah's Witnesses have said it. Other groups have said it. Anytime someone says, I and I alone fully understand, that ought to throw up a red flag to you to watch out. The, you know, one of the dynamics about the Plymouth Brethren, and again, they are the historical ancestors of dispensational thought, as we know it <clears throat> in modern times, uh, they did not accept the historic creeds of the church. To put it bluntly, they were innovators of a radical prophetic view that happens to be today 
the most common view of eschatology. Biblical doctrine should be, however, should be determined by careful exegesis of texts comparing Scripture to Scripture. So that, here's what our Westminster Confession in chapter 1, verse 9, on the authority of Scripture, here's what it says, quote, from the Confession. The infallible rule of interpretation of Scripture is the Scripture itself. And therefore, when there's a question about the true and full sense of any Scripture, which is not manifold but one, it must be searched and known by other places that speak more clearly. So if you run across a text in, in studying the Bible that you sit there and you scratch your head and say, well, I just don't know what it means. Then you have to go to the rest of the Scripture and look at areas that may bring to bear and reveal something that you can help you understand that text. That's the, the, the opera. Uh, the mode that we're to operate under. Therefore, we see here, for the charge that covenant theology is guilty of somehow not having respect for the word of God is, is false and really slanderous in many ways because uh, we do believe the Bible to be the inerrant, infallible, infallible, authoritative word of God. But it does need to be interpreted through the power of the Spirit. So the reality is that not, not even the dispensational premillennialists are consistent in their advocating of their literal approach. And at times, as we're going to see, it can become quite ludicrous at times in some of the interpretations. So what we have to watch out for The danger of every interpreter is this, is to guard against bringing a bias to the Word of God. That is, bringing a system of doctrine and then filtering everything in light of that system of doctrine. Now, that's what we're accused of, and those who advocate covenant thought, theology by the dispensationalists, they accuse us that we are imposing upon the scriptures our view of the covenants. As if our understanding of the covenants, which we've just spent you know, several hours looking at, as if it's a system that we didn't derive from the exegesis of scripture. Where did we get these ideas about Abraham, the Mosaic, the Adamic covenant, but looking at texts of scripture? And so we, what we see here is that, granted, dispensationalists do believe that the Bible has figures of speech, meaning it has figurative language. It uses poetic languages, particularly in the Psalms and the Proverbs, uh, foremost so in those books of the Bible, but not totally with those books. But when, here's the issue. And this is what it boils down to. When is the interpreter to know when it's figurative or not? And interestingly, Charles Ryrie has said this, quote, well, by the way, Charles Ryrie, if I haven't already mentioned, he is a dispensational writer, one of the foremost of our time. He says, quote, the understanding of God's differing economies is essential to a proper interpretation of his relation, revelation within those various economies. What he's saying, you've got to understand the dispensations. Rowry also says, quote, the purpose of language, it seems, is that it requires a literal interpretation, and on that basis it must follow that he would use language and expect man to use it in a literal, normal, and plain sense. And then we have this comment by a dispensationalist by the name of Law Rondell. He says, quote, as you see here, in dispensationalism, we face the fact that the hermeneutic of liberalism accepts Christian typologies for some selected historical parts of the Old Testament but it suddenly rejects each topological application of God's covenant with Israel to Christ's new covenant with his church. 
This seems to be an arbitrary, speculative use of typology with the Old Testament. In other words, any attempt to try to talk about the church in the Old Testament, they say is wrong. And so, we cannot say that absolutely, unequivocally, every text of Scripture must be taken literally. If this is the case, if we adopt what they are saying that we are advocating, and it says, well, you have to take everything literal. Well, really. You know, one time, you know who, who likes to champion that view? Uh, Mormonism believes you ought to take everything very literal. And one time Walter Martin, who wrote a, a great book when he was alive on the kingdom of the cults, he was pre uh, talking somewhere about uh, <clears throat> God, and, and some Mormons heard that he was talking about Mormonism, so they came to hear him. They sat on the front row. When it came time for questions, they, they, they raised their hand. And, of course, when the Bible, they said, when the glory of God passed by Moses, and it said that they... Uh, Moses saw the behind parts of God. They said they saw the physical parts of God. So <laughs> Martin says, really? He says, so you believe that that needs to be understood that way? He said, yeah, that, that's why Mormonism believes that God is an actual physical being. So he says, so everything that it talks about that and those references is the way it ought to be understood. And they said, yeah. And he had them turn to a passage that says, well, no, it talks about... I have, I will bring you my people under my wings. God's a big chicken. <laughs> and all of a sudden, because he says he's going to bring him under his wings, if you say God saw his hind uh, parts and that's a physical being, then God, it says he has wings. So which is it? You see how I can really get tough on those who demand that every passage has to be taken that way. So when the Bible says the mountains clap their hands, do they have hands to clapping with? Uh, when uh, is Jesus really a lamb, a lamb? So when John says, behold the lamb of God, is he a, is he a real lamb? Uh, I'm the door of the sheep to the, the fold. Is he a door? Is, is, is that Jesus? Is he a door? Uh, and so what we see, what, you know, even Nicodemus, Pharisee, who was inquisitive, came to Jesus, and they're talking about being born again, and he says, Nicodemus, you, you got to be born again. Well, Nicodemus thought he meant being physically reborn again. And he didn't understand, and Jesus had to help him out. You've got to be it's spiritual. Of course, the clapping of the hands and the wings, it's metaphorical language. It's poetic language that conveys a point. What is the door? He's the door. He's the entryway. Only by him are you going to have eternal life. The mountains clapping their hands. The whole creation rejoices, as it were, because it's the creation of God. Uh, he's the Lamb of God. He's the Paschal Lamb. Remember the lamb in the Old Testament? They sacrificed lambs. Uh, he is the ultimate sacrifice. He is the perfect sacrifice uh, that was pictured in the Old Testament. It's metaphorical language. And so that we see that when John, Jesus, and here's, here's where others get into trouble, being these, these literalists who insist that it has to be taken that way. For example, when it says... John, uh, Jesus said in John 6, one must eat of his flesh and drink of his blood in order to have eternal life. John 6, 54. You talking about being accountable, Jesus? What are you talking about? He says, I'm the true manner that comes down from heaven. You got to eat of my flesh. You got to drink of my blood. And they struggled with that. And then you have those when Jesus said, in John 2, 19, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Now in verse 20 it says, the Jews therefore said to him, see they're thinking, <laughs> I hate to say it, but the other side in its 
thinking is very much like the thinking that opposed Jesus during his day. So that when Jesus says, destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up. It says in the next verse, those Jews, it said, it took 46 years to build this temple. And you're going to raise it in three days? They're thinking literally here. And they missed the point. Jesus is talking figuratively to him. Well, who's he talking about? He's talking about himself. He's the temple of God. He's come to tabernacle with his people. And so what we see, O.T. Alice, for example, in his great book, and I, it's, it's on the reading list for those of you that are taking this for credit, uh, his book, Prophecy in the Church, Alice makes this very important observation. He says, whether the figurative or spiritual interpretation of a given passage is justified or not depends solely upon whether it gives the true meaning of the text. That's, what you, that's how you have to approach it. Sometimes it's meant to be taken very literal in the way it is. Other times it's taken spiritually. But the, the challenge to an interpreter, it, it is still a challenge. Which one is it? Which one is it? And here's what you have to do. It forces you to get into the Bible and do some studying. That's what it does. And so we see here that as with any scripture, the interpreter must struggle with the exegesis of the text. Paramount in this is the immediate context, meaning proper exegesis deals with an understanding of grammar, the tense of verbs, the relationships of words to one another. That's all part of properly understanding a text. And keep in mind that biblical words just don't come all neatly packed and wrapped for us, floating down from heaven as such in some self-contained means, but the context will tell us the meaning of a word. Now, we're going to resume on this when we come back in the next hour, but you've got to understand that. Sometimes words, the same word, will have a completely different meaning in another text. We're going to start out when we come back, we're going to talk about the word world, cosmos, it has at least three different meanings in Scripture. And I'm here to tell you, if you miss that important hermeneutical point, you're at loss of understanding a lot of Scripture. And you're, you're, going, to be, you're, you're, you're going to struggle. So you've got to understand that the context governs the meaning. So when, so when people say, you have to be careful about this, people say, well, in the Greek... The Greek word means this. And I have to say, the Greek word means what it means in the Greek context. That's what it means. So the Greek word cosmos will mean what it means in a text about cosmos in that text. And of course, it takes the Holy Spirit to understand the Word of God. That's why... Um, we know in the scriptures that 1, John, uh, 1 Corinthians 2, it says that the natural man understands not the things of the Spirit of God. And you ever talk to some unbelievers and they say, I just have no idea what this means. And I say, I understand why. <laughs> now, you don't tell them that. You, you don't tell them that, but don't be surprised they don't understand. They don't understand because they don't have the Spirit. That's why they don't understand. Without the Spirit of God, uh, you don't understand anything. Um, and don't, be, don't shy away from the fact that God has worked in other men to help you understand the Scriptures. Spirit illumined men to help you understand. Years ago in my first pastorate up in the hills of Western Virginia, uh, there is a group of Christians there that don't like 
and really frown upon people that like to use commentaries or read. It says, y'all read nothing but the Word of God. No commentary, nothing. There was one preacher in the area who prided himself in the fact that he could not read. And, he, and, and he, this person would say, I pray that God will make me ignorant and ignorant and ignorant. And I said, that's one prayer God answered. <laughs> and can you imagine having your preacher who can't read? Now, what kind of sermon do you think you're going to get if you can't read? And those who say, you ought not to listen to anything but the word of God, so no commentary because it's man. Now, I've said to some, I said, I guess when you meet at church, you don't have preaching, right? Because the preachers, unless he just reads the scripture and that's it. When you, when you listen to a preacher, you're listening to a fallible man who's interpreting the scriptures. And, of course, that's the onus of responsibility is on me and any preacher. I mean, it is a fearful thing. It is a fearful thing. And let me close with this, uh, this section. When I was in seminary, <clears throat> it, it reformed seminary in Jackson, Mississippi in the 1970s, the seniors were required to give a senior sermon before all the faculty, and they, the faculty would grade uh, his sermon and give him input. And this, this person, uh, his roommate, the way he was approaching it was not the best that his roommate said. It's a very nonchalant way. So he gives his senior sermon, and apparently his text, his, his understanding was way off the wall. And the faculty lovingly just took it apart and said, you know, you have completely missed the understanding of the text, completely. But fortunately, that man went back and literally cried his eyes out. He said that, that I would approach the word of God with such a way that I would completely miss the meaning of the text. And he learned from it, from what I understand. And so God has led other men to an understanding of the scripture. Yeah, I mean, it's the interpretation of men, but who am I to say that I shouldn't read a godly man who walks with God, his understanding of the scripture, who's led by the spirit. And by reading others, you learn that God has indeed worked with other people. <laughs> the spirit does guide other people besides myself. I'm not an arrogant guy or shouldn't be to think I know it all. I don't know it all. And I need to have others to help. And when reading others, you begin to realize, I didn't see that point. Wow, how did I miss that one? pretty obvious and so we have to approach it that way uh, any questions before we come back before we take a break for about eight or nine minutes